Everybody wants to live the good life. And in the world today, certainly in modern America, there are certain basic aspects of that good life that are almost universally assumed and desired. Things like prosperity, health, safety, leisure and pleasure, relationships and family, usefulness and productive meaning in life. That's all of that for some long period of time, uninterrupted, so as to be enjoyed. Something like that is the good life. Now, if you have a religious background of some sort, perhaps you call it the blessed life, to indicate that you acknowledge that God has something to do with that and that you're fortunate to have received it. But basically, it's the same general idea, often. In fact, Psalm 128 assumes that God's people will want this blessed life. Want it enough so as to pursue it. The psalm is built on that assumption. And so it starts there and then makes the point of teaching us where to find it. What path to walk along so as to walk into the good life of God's blessing. The the path of wisdom. And specifically the wise fear of the Lord. That's what we're going to see today. And along the way, as we walk that path, we, we might have the idea of blessing or the blessed life maybe redefined or adjusted a little bit in your mind, corrected perhaps. But let me read Psalm 128, the second of these two wisdom psalms. I mentioned last week that 127 and 128 are connected, they're related as you see the material is somewhat similar. And they are more overtly given to to instruct us than perhaps some of the other psalms. Wisdom psalms. Psalm 128, I'm going to read it and then draw out two observations. Here's the text. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Psalm 128. Two observations, here's the first. The truly blessed life comes to those who fear the Lord. The truly blessed life comes to those who fear the Lord. The psalm has two distinct parts. Verses 5 and 6 at the end are are an expression of, of hope, almost a prayer about blessing, and 1 to 4 are a contained unit about blessing also. You see the beginning and the end of the same, blessed is the one who fears, blessed is the one who fears, and in the middle is blessing described. So we have to to start there. It's as if the the writer is saying to us who are reading it, here's, think think about this, here's here's the, the blessed life. You want this, don't you? You should. It's really good. It's desirable. So, let's think about it. And as we do, at the end of this, I'm, I'm going to point out that this is not actually the main point, but this is a point that, as I thought about this this week, this kind of like rose up in me and became kind of one of those situations where the, the secondary point is perhaps pushing towards most important, for me at least, now. And so, this isn't the main point, but maybe it's important for you too. Let's think about Blessing. First, we get the the basic elements of personal life. The blessed one, verse 2, shall eat the fruit of the labor of his or her hands. In verse 3, a man who's married, his wife will be a Proverbs 31 woman in his house. Industrious, like a growing and fruitful grapevine. Producing not only children, but as you think about the fruit of the vine, producing all kinds of joy and all kinds of delight and good in his house. And a man who is married and has children, they will sprout up like olive shoots. 
They'll flourish and grow quickly and resiliently like olive shoots do, leading to olive oil, a valuable staple of life. These are just very colorful metaphors for describing a blessed family. Which again, like we mentioned last week, is general wisdom, and that is not the same as direct, specific, universal promise. It's important to see that. This is not saying that everyone will always have sufficient and fruitful work and that every man will always have a wife or every woman will always have a husband or that every marriage will always have children, let alone grandchildren. Wisdom passages don't work like that. They aren't giving us promises, let alone laws. They are rather describing a path for us. It it works like this. The assumption is, to think about it again, filling in a little bit for the writer, I'm talking to a man who has a job, a wife, and kids, like most do or will, and which everyone, male and female, of of all different stations in life and of all different ages, but everybody can identify with that. You You can understand it. And I'm saying to this guy, says the wisdom writer, I'm saying to this guy, let me describe for you, sir, a path. Let's, let's call it the path of blessing. Let me describe for you something where, where your labor is not in vain, but is fruitful. And where your wife is like a fruitful vine in your house, and where your kids are like olive shoots around your table every evening. Let me describe that path to you and paint that picture. There is another path, and only one other path, path of, let's call that one, cursing, where you labor all day long only to eat the bread of anxious toil, and where your wife is a dried up, shriveling vine that sends out runners looking for water elsewhere, outside your house, and where your kids spring up like thorns and thistles, and each night are down at the corner with the other hoodlums from the town. There's that path too. Two personal paths. You, you know that second path, the one of miserable cursing, but I'm trying to tell you and, and, and this, describe in a, in a captivating way the, the path of good blessing. So think about this, reader. And this is wisdom literature, so it needs to be thought about. So consider it this morning. Here is the blessed life. So take a breath and take this in. And as you do so, as you sit and look at this, maybe, maybe God will give you eyes to see how much of our own making we've tacked on to God's definition of blessed life. Each of our small personal lives are, are right here, some way or another. Even, even if this isn't exactly you, even if you're, you're single or you're, you're female or you're, you're not married, no kids, you can, you can see this and you can understand it, what it would mean, to, what it would say to your own life. It's not hard to picture this here. You work, and you have enough to eat today. You have your daily bread. Not the bread of anxious toil. To eat the fruit of your labor at rest. And there's nothing here about vacations, or vacation homes, or leisure travel, or hobbies, or the latest iPhone or SUV, or the the most important sports travel team. You work and you eat. And you look across the table at a wife who is yours, a spouse who is yours, not someone else's, who is lush and green and thriving herself. And then you both look at kids who are growing up as your heritage, God's gift given to you to be useful in the world. Nothing there about 
their exceptional intelligence or athletic ability. Maybe they're just average, which by definition, almost everybody is. Maybe they're, they're just normal kids and there's nothing here that says your spouse is ravishingly beautiful or that you are hip and cool. There is nothing Instagram worthy in this psalm. It's, it's not that coolness is bad or that beauty is bad or that, in, that intelligence is bad and SUVs and iPhones and hobbies and vacations are themselves wrong. I'm not saying that. This is not saying that. Those things are good and fine and often they are gifts given from God and I pursue some of those things myself. For sure. It's just that they are irrelevant to the question. Blessed life, yes or no? They are irrelevant to the question. Thus shall the man be blessed, it says. It's just dinner after a day's work. The breaking of daily bread with people whom God has given to each other who then go to sleep and rest under his hand as they prepare for tomorrow's fruitful work in dependence on God. That's the blessed life. And it is simple. And that personal life, it sits in a larger context that makes it all sustainable. The larger context shows up in the next verses, in 5 and 6. Notice a larger view there. We're now talking about something outside of the, the personal home. May the Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem, that is, the good of the city of God, the good of God's people, as we've discussed previously from previous Psalms. He's saying, may you see God's whole people, all of God's people, cared for and caused to thrive by God himself, reigning from Zion. That's where his temple is, where his throne is, where God sits in our midst, right in the middle of the, the people of God, and extends out from there his good reign over all of the people. Or to put it differently, verse 6, may you see generations with peace upon all the people of God. Safe and secure and prospering for a long time. This is the larger community context in which my personal dining room table sits. The blessing of God encompasses all of that. Me and us. Together, the us and the me, together for generations, prospered, thriving, safe. It's the community of the church together under God's blessing with him dwelling in our midst, extending his good, loving rule over all. This is the picture of the blessed life laid out right here in this psalm. And this kind of simple contentment Pretty desirable. The psalm, in fact, is not trying to sell us on it. It assumes that when we see it, that, it, that, would, that would capture us. We would want this if we remembered it, layered kind of beneath all the other stuff that we kind of add on top, all the other wants and desires that we, that we think form the simple blessed life. This is something that would be universally understandable and desirable and attainable. The blessed life that people want. So, we need to pause there for a second and ask yourself a question, Christian. And this is why I think this, this piece of it became kind of maybe a little bit more important for me this week as I thought about it, ask yourself this question. Would you be good with that? Just that. Daily bread and sleep in a home that is good with itself and with sits, sits in the context of a church that is thriving under the rule of God who dwells in our midst and makes us a people at peace period. Just that. Would you be good with that? Or 
do you also need something else added on to it? It is easy to let the world determine what blessing is and what we need and what we should be aiming for and what we should be discontent if we don't get. It is easy to find layered on top of of this very simple picture, layered on top of that, some type of, of achievement, some type of advance, acquisition or experience, something else that as I look around, I look at my next door neighbor, that would be good right there. Or I read the paper or I listen to something uh, that I receive online, like there would be something. Are you good with this? This is the blessed life. And maybe right now, as you kind of sit artificially locked up, with some of those things being taken away, maybe right now there's an opportunity for you, Christian, to notice what you think you also need. In our because you can't get it right now. And maybe, artificially locked up and contained, maybe actually you're discovering having that taken away has been good. We've been like reduced to simplicity here in some ways, and that's actually been helpful. Let's not add that back on in the near future. Don't skip over this. Ask this question right now. This is the blessed life. But the real point, here's the real point of the passage at least, beginning of verse 1 and end of verse 4. Behold, here's how a man, how a woman gets that blessed life. He fears the Lord. This is how everyone can be blessed like this, fear of the Lord. You want this good life? Walk in the fear of the Lord. That, that's the main point of the passage. The, the passage assumes we would understand the blessed life that we would want it. And the point is to say, verse 1, verse 4, here's how you get that. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. That's the main point of this passage. And and in, in putting that out there, God is not concerned, not, not addressing some other realistic questions that, that we may have, that would be pers- perfectly realistic to have. You know, what, what about, I don't have a spouse. What about my spouse that I had is dying? What about we don't have children? What about when the righteous suffer under injustice? All those things are, are real in this fallen world, and that's not what God's talking about here. He is one main, very important, focused foundational point is to put his finger on blessing comes on the path of wisdom that is the path of the fear of the Lord and that's the point right there where most of America and most of the world says no thanks I'm out I want this blessed life I want something like this I want the good life but I want it on a different path apart from the Lord and his ways. Seems to me, I, I am no great cultural student or prognosticator, but it seems to me that the current atmosphere in America has very, very little interest in repenting. That the current atmosphere in America as we face these troubling times is that we are going to get through this together. We're going we're gonna to band together. We're going we're gonna to do some, some hard things and we're going to make some sacrifice and some suffering and we're going to make it through as a people if we join together and hopefully not too many folks will die and hopefully the recession won't last that long so we can get back to doing what we were doing before, pursuing the good life apart from God and the rejection of his ways. That's what it seems is going on in America today. And perhaps one of the purposes God has in bringing the coronavirus, and God does have purposes in bringing the coronavirus. 
Nothing happens outside of his control and the purpose of his sovereign hand. He's doing a thousand things, most of which we'll never know. But what if, what if one of the purposes is to confront and to, to expose, maybe even to rebuke a little bit, that near universal mindset in this country? We are in pursuit of the good life in rejection of God and his ways. That's what the world is committed to. And maybe, and we should pray for this, maybe right now God is taking a moment in kindness to speak to those who have ears to hear and to say that path doesn't lead where you think it leads. It doesn't. You, you want the blessed life. You, want the, you should. You should want the good life. You should want that. But that, the path that leads there is the path of wisdom. That is the path of the fear of the Lord. You can't walk away from God and find the good life. You can't. It may seem like it for a little while, but that's just a deception. It doesn't lead there. We should pray that that message comes through to folks and that they, they hear that. It would be a good thing if that was one of the things God was doing now to speak to some people and alert them. You're too small. You're too weak. You, you face problems that you can't handle. You can't control them. You can't fix them long enough and well enough in ways that don't just double down on difficulty in the future. If that's you, hear him kindly speaking to you and saying, in this moment right now, you need me. I'm the one you need. I'm the only one who gives the good life like this, this life of rest, this life of blessing. We should pray that that message comes through and that, that there is an unsettling and that we don't just come back to things like normal in a few months. Something should change. May God do that, if not nationwide, in particular people's hearts and minds. We should pray for that to be heard out there, but especially we should pray for that to be heard in here. For that message to be heard in the church, among we who are God's people. We are made and called to walk in the fear of the Lord. Made for it and called to it. It is everywhere in the Bible. I don't remember the numbers, but, but I, I heard a preacher one time talking about some of the top commands in the Bible. If you hear something like trust the Lord, something like love the Lord, and something like fear the Lord, fear the Lord is way more frequent. I don't remember the numbers. So I didn't bother to check this. But fear the Lord is far more common. It's everywhere. We're made for it, we're called to it, and we're enticed to it. I mean, this, this, is, this is an enticement here. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. That's an awesome offer to, to it says, everyone, not just to men, not, not to women, to everyone, and not to rich people or poor people, not to educated people or uneducated people, to everyone in every culture and in every place on the earth, Here's an offer made to you. The blessed life can be experienced by you, whoever you are, along this path. Fear the Lord. So, at your duty and your delight, do you do it? Do you walk in the fear of the Lord? Well, what does that mean? It's not just fear as in the emotion of being scared. You have to be careful not to take completely, to take out completely any sense of emotion because if it wasn't something emotional about being scared, it wouldn't be using the word fear. So there is something there, but we've got to think carefully about it. It's not just the emotion of being scared. I find it helpful to think about electricity. Perhaps you've heard me mention this before. If you've ever done any electrical work in your house, rewired an outlet perhaps, or more, taken the cover off of that master panel, the big metal box, 
if you've done any of that, you have some idea, some idea, I'll say more about this later, but some idea about what this fear is like. You're not so scared that you run away from it, you have nothing to do with it, but you are fearing wisely. You're not casual, but you're very careful to conform yourself to the realities of the electricity and then proceed accordingly. You aren't thoughtless about the power that's present. You don't assume you'll be fine. You don't assume the warnings are for other guys. You don't expect that it won't matter just this one time. You don't go with your feelings because deep down inside it just feels like the power's off. No. You reckon very clearly with the truth that this kind of power does not share its authority with you. It declares and you respond. You are careful, humble beneath it. You do not contend with it, but are careful to obey it in all of its ways. You fear this power. Well, to fear the Lord is similar. It's the, the inner attitude within the heart and mind of carefully regarding God as supreme and being willingly determined not to contend with him, not to resist him. Or to put it positively, it looks like the last phrase of verse 1, rephrasing fear, who walks in his ways. To fear and walk in his ways. Again, all through the Bible, repeatedly, these two things are connected. To fear the Lord is to walk in his ways. To fear God is to keep his commandments. If you think of the end of Ecclesiastes, what's the, what's the sum of all things? Fear God and keep his commandments. A Godward trust, a Godward dependence, a Godward reverence, a Godward awe, a Godward care that has him defining what is reality for me and then me responding to him submissively and obediently, careful to walk, mindful of God and what he thinks, careful to do his commandments. This is how we are to walk with God, not to become saved, but because we are his people already and this is how we should respond to one we call Lord. How does that lead to the blessed life? Well, if you think about that, that posture, one that is attentive to him, that has, that has eyes fixed on him and is careful to hear what he says and careful to walk in obedience to it, what, what that what that person is, that person is walking that path, is walking in obedience to God's word in God's world. And those two things are aligned. God's word and God's word world align in truth. And so that person is, if you will, cutting with the grain of the world. Think of the, the realms of blessing here, the, the personal house. A husband, pick a husband here, who walks in the fear of the Lord, walks in obedience to his ways, is going to pick up Ephesians 5 and say, there I see how I am to be a husband to this wife. How I am to lay down my life for her, how I am to care for her. That will create a better marriage. We'll pick up passages that say, how am I to, to be with these children? I'm not to provoke them, but I am to, to care for them and wisely shepherd them and teach them and raise them up in the fear of the Lord. That will create a better home all around. And a church, the next level, the church that says, well, we walk in the fear of the Lord together. What is the, what is the command? That'll be a church that's void of gossip, that is void of backbiting, that is, in fact, characterized with people who love one another and lay down their lives for one another. That'll be a place that is prospering and thriving, that is at peace. So 
to walk in the fear of the Lord, to obey his commandments, brings us into a place where we walk into the path of blessing. That is, we cut with the grain of the wood. But lastly, the the last piece of blessing is with God in our midst. It's not just that we do the right things, it's that we are, in fact, ourselves communing with God personally. Think of the opposite of this. To walk not in the fear of the Lord, to reject his ways, would be to grieve his spirit and drive God away. So we actually welcome God near and say, Lord, fill me, Lord, control me, Lord, change my heart and my mind. Make me, myself, more like Jesus. Fill me with your spirit. To walk in the fear of the Lord, then, helps us to cut with the grain of the world, but also fills us with God's spirit. All of that leads to blessing. All of that is offered to us and laid out to entice us and, in fact, commanded And we should consider this very often. If you look back through history, very often revivals begin. You even think about the word revival. Revival first starts in the church. And first starts in the church with a renewed, refreshed, reinvigorated care about the person of God. And a commitment on the part of the church, of the people in the church, to say, I will walk with him and walk after him. Hear him and follow him. And I will cherish what he gives this simple life. And I will not chase the world. I will walk happy in the blessed life in the fear of the Lord. That kind of church closes up with God, walks a path that is blessed in communion with God, and then stands in the midst of the world and says, look, here's the blessed life. And it comes not from me and my goodness and my intelligence and my skill, but it comes from walking after him, follow him. Maybe this time is an opportunity for you, for us, to clear the decks of our hearts. To clear away other things that have crept in. Some of the idols that have drawn away our attention. Now, the tricky thing with idols is that idols, the best idols, are often actually good and permissible things that we just get out of order. The best, what I mean by that, is the the trickiest idols. So perhaps we've got to clear them out Clear them away so we can see and follow and fear him and not be captured by them, not make other things supreme. To hold to him as God, to hold to him as Lord and to walk in the ways that he commands us and to repent where needed. We should pray that the world hears this message, but we should pray that the church hears this message. The path to the blessed life is the path of wisdom that is the path of walking in the fear of the Lord. We should pursue that. But if it was left to us to pursue it just ourselves, we would not get there. Which leads to the second point, which is shorter. Secondly, the Lord has done great things in order to bring us this blessed life. The Lord has done great things in order to bring us this blessed life. So I'm leaning here on the Lord has done. If you, if you think about the dynamic in the first part, especially if you, if you look at just the first four verses in particular, the dynamic there is one of, you want the blessed life that comes in walking in the fear of the Lord, so that's what we do. We walk in the fear of the Lord and we repent and we clear away idols off the deck of our hearts, and then we, we find then the blessing of God along that path. That, that might seem a little bit like what we do all about us, but then you add in verses 5 and 6 and you realize, oh, actually God has to give this because there's a hope expressed. The Lord bless you from Zion. This blessing of somebody, may the Lord give it. May the Lord give it. It's, it's actually almost a prayer. 
I want you blessed. May the Lord bless you. May he do that. God, would you do that? There's an alert here that actually God has to do this. God must do something that brings to us this blessing. Or if we think about what we've already seen, God must do something that grows in us the proper fear of him. That he might give us this blessing. So there's something to think about here, this side of the cross. All throughout the Old Testament, as I said, over and over again, you can find this teaching about the fear of the Lord as I've described it. You can find this teaching about the blessing of God as I've described it. It's everywhere. And it just never quite happens. One classic place you may know of is the foot of Mount Sinai. You read about this in Deuteronomy 5. The foot of Sinai, the giving of the, the Ten Commandments, and the mountain is quaking. You picture the setting there. The mountain is quaking and smoking. There's lightning, and it's a loud voice. It is, it is the epitome of intimidating. And the people of God say, no, no, we're not going. They send Moses. Moses, you go. You go. You tell us what God says, and we'll do that. They are fearing him, and they are expressing clear willingness to obey everything the loud voice from that smoking, thundering mountain commands us. There is fear, and there is expressed obedience. And God then, as a side comment, says, oh, that's too bad. Oh, that they always had this kind of heart to fear me, and do all that I command, that it may go well with them and their descendants. Hear the similarity? Fear me, do what I command, that it may go well with them, blessing, and the people after them. That's not going to happen. He knows what's in their hearts. Oh, that they had this kind of heart. There, there's nothing that could have been, I don't know how God could have devised another setting that would be more intimidating. Better at creating fear. But he knew that wouldn't work by itself. He knew that he had to do even greater things than what he did at Mount Sinai in giving us the law. He had to do something more to create a people with hearts that fear him. And, and realize this, he wanted to do that. He did not say, Deuteronomy 5, I give out the law, I give it my best shot, that hasn't changed their hearts, so... Done. No, no. He did not do that. He actually wanted to do still more. He recognized the need. Oh, that their hearts were, but they aren't. So I will commit myself to a long and costly process of giving them the kind of hearts that fear me, that I might give them the kind of hearts that obey me, that I might give them the kind of hearts that experience blessing from me and their children after them. He commits himself to do that. He wants us to find and to walk along the path of blessing. This, this is the God who is generous and good, not demanding and austere. He's the God who is generous and good. So what did he do? O oh Lord, bless them from Zion. Not me, I'm good. Bless them from Zion. May the Lord bless you from Zion, says someone. This is the prayer, ultimately this is the prayer of the faithful one who walked, whose delight was in the fear of the Lord. This is Isaiah 11 talking about the Messiah. The Messiah is the only one who ever walked and who ever perfectly delighted in the fear of the Lord. And this is the one who said, Lord, would you bless your people from Zion? And you know what I'm about to talk about. I, I hope you 
see this coming a mile away and that your heart is tuned always to realize that every road leads back to Jesus and the cross. Every road leads back to what God has done in Christ crucified. What did he do to give us hearts that fear him that we might find the blessing of God? He lifted up one who should have been, the only one who should have been, perfectly blessed, who should have walked in the fullness of life in communion with God because he's the only one who ever feared him. And he said to that one, I will curse you instead. That he might give us his blessing. And so a bunch of things happened. We should think about a couple things here really quickly. Let me list off just a couple things. At the cross, God provides in Christ forgiveness for our non-fearing, disobedient hearts. Amen. And at the cross, God then puts us in the place where it is righteously permissible that he bless us and not curse us. He should righteously condemn us, but at the cross, he makes us to stand righteous in Christ, and so it is permissible and right for him to bless us. All of that, but this is what we need to think about, I think, this morning. And you've got to think about this. Now, I don't have a lot left to say here, so you're going to have to think, but I don't have to think for very long. So track with me on this. The cross gives us hearts of proper fear and gives us the means to grow in that fear properly. To grow in proper depth and breadth of the fear of the Lord. Properly. In other words, let me say it differently, You are a new creation, so you do regard the Lord as holy. You do carefully consider him differently than you did before. You must if you're a Christian. And you have the spirit of God living in you that can grow you and does. So how does he do that? And here's where the illustration of the electricity that I mentioned before exposes itself as not quite sufficient. How the Spirit of God grows in us the proper fear of God is not just by the electricity means. That's too one-dimensional. If you think about the electricity illustration, it does capture the, the idea of I'm focused, I'm intent, I'm not careless, I'm, I'm careful, I submit myself to it. It captures all of that, but it only does it by one, one means, by intimidation. Threat of death. Because if I don't and I touch that thing, I might die. I'll at least get a little shock. It's intimidation by, by threat of pain and threat of death. And that's too one-dimensional to accurately capture the fear of the Lord. And that's too one-dimensional to capture how God aims to grow in us through the work of Jesus, the fear of the Lord. God's Spirit generates in us. God's Spirit first comes to live inside of us and then generates in us proper reverence and awe of the Lord. And this then is what we need to pursue, look for, read about, pray, ask, discuss with one another. The Spirit generates proper reverence and awe of the Lord by showing us all of the ways, all of the ways, the multifaceted ways that God is over and other. Holy. That's what holy means. Other. We always feel a sense of, we use the word fear, when we are in the presence of something that is other. We see something 
a little bit strange, a little bit freaky, a little bit unpredictable, a little bit hard to, hard to fathom, hard to understand. And the first thing we think is, ooh, what's that? There's a little bit of a, uh. So God grows in us fear by showing us all of the ways that God is other. And this is what we pick up our Bible looking for and what we pray asking to have shown to us and what we discuss with one another. The otherness, the holiness of God. The otherness of God in his wisdom. The otherness of God in his righteousness. The Spirit wants to show us the absolutely unique control of God over the world. To reveal his utterly astonishing mercy. To show to us God's limitless justice and how resolved he is to execute it perfectly, finally. His abounding goodness, his overflowing power, his wide, long, high, deep love, and his calm patience. His beautiful, pursuing, passionate commitment. His grace. All of this and more. The Spirit of God wants to open up our eyes and show us in his word and speak to us as we commune with him in prayer to show us all of the glory of God, all of the ways that he is far higher and far longer and, and wider and deeper than anything we can imagine, anything we can understand, anything we experience, anything we are. And to have that writ large on our minds, the weight of that as God's Spirit causes it to sit on us would cause us to say, to shake our heads and wonder, who is this? The Spirit of God causes God in our minds to be lifted up and to be seen as holy, 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 as, as holy other than us. We look back through the Bible and we see a God who made everything from nothing and who then responded to a people who were racked with sin by wiping it out, by preserving a people in a boat. Can you imagine that? who then made a promise to one man and gave him children, though he was well past prime. Who then built up a nation and protected them through slavery in Egypt for centuries, brought them back to a place, planted them firmly, protected them from all comers, but then when they walked away from him, sent them away. Read the story and you see a God who reigns over all of this in awesome power and wisdom and patience and grace and mercy and justice and righteousness and so on and so on and so on. The Spirit of God wants to say, I want to show you God. God in glory. God in, in awesome, majestic breadth. Splendid. Far above you. I don't just want to show you something to scare the snot out of you. I want to show you something to make you wonder. Oh, what is that? In the face of whom the draws of the world seem, are you kidding me, small? That he would be the one, that he would become the one regarded thought about, considered and marveled at. Yes, and, and dared not be discarded or disregarded or slighted, but that he would become the one that is holy, holy, holy in our eyes. That is the work that God accomplished in the cross to put his spirit into us and show us everything of himself for us and not against us. So I really hope that I did not just lose you because that needs to be thought about. And if you think about that, then it tells you, okay, I know what I'm in pursuit of now. I, what am I supposed to do with that? 
I'm not just supposed to marvel at that on a Sunday morning. I'm supposed to be in pursuit of that. What I'm supposed to do is I want the blessed life. I want to walk the path of wisdom in the fear of the Lord. And what God has done to help me with that is that God has given me his word and promised to commune with me in prayer in a lifelong process of saying, look at who I am. Look at what I've done. Look at what I'm like. Look at how that is for you. Look at your need that I answer. Look at the amazing, unpredictable ways that I respond. Look how much I wait patiently, patiently, patiently with you. You don't know anybody like me, do you? Look how, look at me, look at this, look at, look, 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 and marvel and look and be captured. That's your job, is to pick up this word and say, show me yourself, Lord. And God, by his spirit, says, absolutely my delight. I want to answer the prayer of my son to bless you from Zion. That's my job, happily, by my choice to show myself to you, to draw you to walk in the fear of me for your blessing and for my glory. Christian, if you put that down and walk away, what you're saying is, no thanks. No thanks. May God work out of us a contentedness with the little of him that we drink in and may he give us a desire for more. Me too. Start, start with me. You know, the whole thing about revival, every Christian should say, I'm going to draw a circle on the ground. I'm going to stand at it and say, start the revival in this circle. Start with me. I need this too. I'm not, I'm not preaching to you. I'm preaching to us, me Let us not be a people who says, no thanks, I'm good with what I got, but instead be a people who says, Lord, show yourself to me. Draw me to regard you as holy, to fear you. To keep your commandments. To walk the path of blessing. O Lord, bless your people from your throne by growing in us now proper regard of you in deep and careful and blessed fear. Let's pray. Father, I need this. You know that. I need this. We all need this. Please do it. Please take your spirit in us. And move us to follow your decrees. Show us your glory. Graciously help us to set you apart as Lord in our lives. That's the first piece of then being prepared to give an answer to those who ask us for the hope that we have. Well, I've set apart this one as Lord in my life and I'm walking after him in the fear of him and experiencing his blessed life. That's what. Help us with that, please, Father. We need your help. Make us a people who are after you. Build your church. Honor your name. Change this world. Bring revival, we ask you. Start here. Start with me. Thank you, Lord. Amen.